So, last time we talked about consumer behavior and the factors that influence consumer behavior today, we're going to talk about business to business marketing. This is important for a number of reasons. A lot of you will go into the business to business marketing context. If you go into our sales program, for example, what we, we, what we primarily train you for in that program is dealing with business to business sales, not you know, selling used cars on a Saturday afternoon at Lynn Hickey Dodge. Lynn Hickey was this really obnoxious car dealer that was down on May Avenue at I-44 in May. And he would have like a crane up in the air with a car in it. I'm not coming down until we sell you know, 10,000 cars. And it didn't matter what you went into Lynn Hickey to buy, you walked out with the Dodge Dynasty for some reason. Everybody in their, their dog walked out with a Dodge Dynasty. So that's not what we really try and get you to do in our professional sales program. Mostly you're going to be selling the business. And even if you are not going to go into marketing and sales, studies show that you're, you know, those of you that are finance majors or accounting majors, you're actually going to go into sales jobs, at least initially. And so it's important to understand this context. But the difference is between selling to businesses and selling to consumers. So we're going to start with a critical thinking challenge for the day in your groups. And I'm going to give you 30 minutes to come up with a five paragraph essay on uh, this critical thinking challenge. Last time I argued that lots of consumer behavior is predicated on what we call the rational actor model. A lot of research is predicated on what we call the rational actor model. And that model is not necessarily reflective of the way people actually buy things. In fact, it may only apply to a very small percentage of the sales that we actually engage in. Buying a house may be rational actor. Although I made an argument that even with regard to buying a house, people act irrationally. And I gave you an example of that with the carpet. Most people would, you know, I mean, if you think about it rationally, you'd rather have the carpeting allowance than the carpet that somebody else chooses for you. But because we can't visualize it, or a lot of people can't visualize it, uh, they don't engage in the most rational decision. And they actually settle for something that maybe is less than their ideal. So. Our organizations, and I want you to consider all three types. So when we talk about business to business, that's what we label it, B2B, marketing. We're not really just talking about business. We're talking about three types of organizations. A lot of them are going to be business organizations, but there are a lot of other organizations out there that we might want to sell to, like nonprofits. What are nonprofits? The American Red Cross, the American Heart Association. Things like that are not for profit. They have they exist in the private sector, but they don't exist to make a profit. And then governmental entities, which are an important component of our economy. In fact, probably 40% of jobs in some way are dependent upon the government. So our organizations, considering all three types, profit, nonprofit, or governmental, more rational than individual consumers, and give me why. I want three substantive examples. So you should develop a five, brief five paragraph uh, essay response. I'm gonna give you 30 minutes to do this. So you can, you know, I, I would do this, if it were me, I would have, you know, my first paragraph with the introduction, with my thesis statement would be, organizations are or are not more you know, rational than individuals or less rational than individuals, depending on what your argument is, as exemplified by McDonald's, Walmart. You know, I would give an example of each three types of McDonald's, the American Heart Association, you can't use my examples, by the way, and the University of Central Oklahoma and its purchasing department. So three examples, uh, which will be discussed below. Now, if you want to win bonus points, for this critical thinking challenge. And there were a couple of groups that did an exceptional job on the last critical thinking challenge and won bonus points. I'm going to tell you that the easy answer here is to say, of course, these entities are more rational than consumers. That's the easy answer. That's not the answer that will win you bonus points. 
That's the easy answer. That's the low-hanging fruit. If you want bonus points, you're going to have to think about how they're not more rational than individuals. I'm giving you a big hint. If you want, if you want the low-hanging fruit, it's easy to say, yep, they're equally as rational. Come up with three substantive examples and then have a conclusion. So I will give you 30 minutes. It is now 12.35, so you have until 1.05 to develop your answers. You be sure to be back at 1.05 computer lab. Be sure to be back right in front of the group, definitely. Okay, so. With this group, what's your, who's your, what? Is this is this one group here? Okay. What's your what's your group answer? We said yes. You said that yes, organizations are more rational than individuals. Yes. Okay. Why? Because they always act for the most benefit for the company, or they get the most utility. Okay. And if business is a business to make profit. Okay. Whereas an individual might act selfishly and take whatever they want just because they want it. Uh, so our first example was a GameStop video game store. Okay. Uh, one of the main things they do is they advertise the game that they think is going to sell the most, not the game that everybody loves or everybody thinks is the highest rated. So that's why a lot of like underappreciated games go under the radar. Okay. And then for nonprofit, uh, who think of like the YWCA, the Shelter for Battered Women? A lot of the things they do, they do it for the better good of the women. So like, they'll enforce a uh, how do you say, like a nighttime curfew type of thing. So okay. That the women stay safe, even though they want to go out and party or something. They tell them, hey, if you don't stay here, you're not you're not welcome here, basically. So that's one of the things they do to keep everybody safe. Um, and then government, so we kind of thought DMV, how they run it, they want the fastest utility possible, so they want people in and out, not what people want. People want to go first, people want to do this way, that way. They say, no, you're going to do it our way, you're going to take a ticket number and wait. So we thought that was the most rational way that they could do it. Right, it's just first come, first yeah. serve. You, if you're in line to take your test at this point, you get in, and that they're just trying to serve the most number of people in the most efficient yeah. way possible. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we reached that conclusion that yes, the organizations act more rationally. Okay, so organizations are more rational than individuals when they when they make decisions. Okay, I'll buy I'll buy that argument. All right, so I said I do that half of the room. So on the second row, which is your team yes. primarily over here? We're all just right. Okay, so I've got a team that's right there, right? So I'll do them and I'll do you all with this half of the room. So what'd you guys say? So we said that they're kind of very similar in the sense that they both use the synthesis model, both rational and irrational. Uh, we focus more on like the organizational, you know, we said that depending on the level of management, where you are in decision making, like if you're an organizational bottom row manager, you know, it's kind of probably a little more off the cuff. You're not, it's irrational while still using, you know, policies and procedures that you have in place to kind of guide that decision. So, kind of both rational and irrational. As you get to like middle manager, you're kind of more focused, I mean, kind of have a little more ambiguity. ambiguity. I can't say the word. Ambiguity. Thank you very much to your decisions. Uh, seeing as you don't necessarily have a policy in place for it, you kind of have to think rational about it. And when you get to the top managers, they have a lot of time to plan and organize, and it's, it's less uh, irrational, much more focused on you know the good and the, and the goals of the company. Okay, so those long-term strategy goals, you think they're more rational. What are your three examples? Uh, honestly, didn't get that far. Didn't get to the three examples? Yeah, uh, kind of focused on that for a long time. Okay, all right, so you think they're more, you think they're a hybrid, depending yeah. on the level, at you, that's a novel, that's a novel concept, I've never thought of it in terms of whether or not you're dealing with sort of a street level, you know, employee, face-to-face, -face, doing customer service versus upper management. That's a unique way of coming up with it. It'll be interesting to see what your 
your examples are when you do that, okay? Was there any another team on this row, on the second row? All the same. All the same team, okay. So starting on the back row, which team is? I guess you guys are the back row. Yeah, we're going, I'm going front row, middle row, back row on this half of the class, and then I'm gonna, so, you know, just to kind of divide up who gets to go first, different ways, making it more interesting. So what did you guys say? Um, we said that um, both organizations and individual consumers are both rational. Um, Target and Amazon being our profit examples, um, they have to think about uh, planning, strategically planning, so that's reaching towards their ultimate goal, so that's thinking logically. Okay. For nonprofits, locally, the um, nonprofit that we came up with was Gear Up, and they, their goal is to better the community while nationally we have Red Cross, um, again with the strategic planning, while governmental, though we argued that one of the disadvantages that they show was that they are cutting budgets on education. So that isn't rational. You don't think the government's or the cutting of, of budgets on education is rational? No, I do not think so. Why not? Because if you, ooh, okay. um, <laughs> If you have no money, you have to cut somewhere. Well, why Can you, you cut put prisons? money into transit yeah. systems and locally? You could what? Why would you put money locally into transit systems and you could generate the community? Okay. And it also has to do with like class, basically. It's okay. I did that, like I've been in public schools. They have much better uh, public schools rather than if you were to go south of. To Oklahoma City. <laughs> basically. Okay. Um, and then individual consumers. They ultimately have one goal when reaching towards, that they are reaching towards. They are more self-centered, mm -hmm. um, so that makes it more logical for them. And they are not as limited to like going through different management or committees to make these decisions. Okay. Yeah, they don't have to go through any, you know, if you have a family unit, I suppose you have to check with your insignificant other about purchases, but for the most part, you can make your own purchase decisions. Okay, all right, so let's see. Did all of the second row, were there other teams on the back row over here? Okay, go ahead. What's your argument? Right. We were saying that organizations are not more rational than individual consumers. Okay. And that is because reasons why is the company is trying to sell a product to the consumer that they do not need. So their whole business model is selling something in hopes that they can convince someone that they need it. Okay, but like, like let's take an example of grocery stores. Are they selling stuff that you don't need? There's a lot of things in there that they don't need. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff in there that you don't need. So milk. You don't no need milk. milk. No one needs milk? You need like, if you get down to the base of it, you need like bread, meat, and water. Bread, meat, and water. Vegetables, but there's, it's a whole giant store filled with lots of things. That, that you don't need. Not at all. Right. And milk is actually one of them. That's actually a very good example. We're the only animal that will consume lactose after the weaning. And in fact, it's not terribly good for us. In fact, most people are slightly lactose intolerant. So it's, it's not necessarily, so they've got all these commercials out on, you know, got milk and encouraging you to drink milk. Not necessarily all that good for you. Okay. Uh, we use Apple as an example of for profit because okay. it's, it's purely a luxury product. That there's plenty of simpler ones out there, but it's a status thing to where you buy it because you want to look good to other people. And they know that, so they're going to keep raising the price and they know you'll buy it anyway. Okay. And for our nonprofit, we put Goodwill. Good, yeah, Goodwill because they expect you to give them things that they will then sell back to you and it works for some reason. Okay. And for our government one, we put the military because, uh, we'll just use the wording that we put, the United States military branches are a great example of irrational government organizations. 
the military has an understanding between the citizens and its values that the citizens should willingly join these branches in order to benefit themselves and their fellow citizens by joining by joining the support and the defense of the nation. This in no way directly benefits those that join these military branches other than in, other than their sense of civic duty and feelings of national support. Okay. So you're putting yourself at risk for other people so that when the government will pay you for it. But you gotta you gotta make a living somehow, so is that irrational? There's lots of safer ways to do it. Let's suppose you really like killing. <laughs> You're a really aggressive individual. Isn't this a rational way of, of channeling? You could be a serial killer, but this this is the this is the legal way of channeling that negative energy. <laughs> okay. All right. So you don't think the military is rational? All right. Like I'll buy that. Maybe not. Very good. Let's see. What other? Do we have another team over here? Um, we um, we said yes and no in that certain organizations have to be rational and others do not. Uh, so let's profit the organizations. Okay. By being subject to the market and, and, and subject to good decision making being that that's how they are able to continue to exist. Mm -hmm. If they don't make good decisions, if they don't make rational decisions, they won't exist anymore. Whereas governmental organizations like the post office or Amtrak, those don't have to make rational decisions in order to exist, they're not going anywhere. Okay, let's let's take one argument at a time. Your argument about the rationality of business organizations and for-profit models. What percentage of businesses fail within the first five years? Ninety percent. Ninety percent fail within the first five years. So are they really that rational? Okay. So we could say that but the ones that survive are rational. rational. Right. Okay. And the ones that don't obviously so. But governmental organizations. To some extent, nonprofit organizations do not have to be rational and often aren't. Okay. Right, go to the post office. Okay. It's a headache because they're not going anywhere because their their existence is guaranteed politically. Uh, there's no competition. Well, there's competition, but there's no competition that will push them out of. Yeah, there's no real competition. Nobody can nobody can deliver mail for the cost of the post office. Exactly. Does it. So, and uh, nonprofit doesn't have to be rational, but uh, because their existence is not necessarily in the delivering to their stakeholders, mm -hmm. because there are less stakeholders in the bottom line to think of, but their existence is threatened if they like make it, I don't know if this would be a good example at all, but if they pay more to salaries of their executives, as many charities do, then act, then act goes to actual charity work. If the public doesn't know about that, obviously there's it's not really going to happen, but the public finds out there's an outcry that directly threatens the existence of the organization. Yeah, and from time to time they do get found out how much their executive directors make. So, for example, one of the ones that came out recently was the Washington Press Corps is a non-for-profit organization that exists to support the Washington Press. And they say that they do all kinds of good things by giving away scholarships to young people who are going to go into journalism and ultimately cover Washington, D.C., but they actually pay their executive director of the Washington Press Corps something like $300,000 a year, and the number of scholarships that they give out are, like, minimal compared to their overall budget, and they're paying this person a huge amount of, uh, amount of money. So, yeah, and that, that happens. But if you think about it, if you want to get talented people, for example, for the American Red Cross, I would be willing to bet, I haven't looked recently, but I'd be willing to bet that the salary of the executive director of the American Red Cross is approaching a million dollars. But if you want to get talented people that are going to raise a lot of money, you're going to have to pay that, probably, to get somebody at that level. It's a, a nationwide organization. They are responsible for a budget that's hundreds of millions of dollars. And if you compare that to the private sector, if you want to get qualified people, to, to manage your money and do it well, you're going to have to pay probably a lot of money um, to get that kind of talent, to, to lead the private sector and take on the challenges of things like the American Red Cross or the American Heart Association. Okay, what else did you have for, you did all three, is that right? Okay.
So I got everybody on this side of the, from here over. Is that right? Okay. So we'll start with the front row over here. Are you, are you the spokesman? Okay. Okay, so we said that organizations are less rational than individual consumers. And then our first one is for profit and we used Apple and like that Steve Jobs had this whole plan set out that probably not a lot of people knew, but like one of his main things was we're never gonna have an iPad mini. And as soon as Steve Jobs dies, they're like, we're gonna make an iPad mini because this is gonna make That's us a lot of money. That's what the consumers want. Yeah. And so basically for profits are basically following they're following the money, they're trying to get a higher bottom line than their competitors so that they can keep existing, which may be a rational base, but the way that, the extent to where they're following the money is irrational. Okay. Um, and then, I'm not sure I agree with that, but I like the Steve Jobs because I think that's an example of, yeah, you have this one guy who's basically the cult of personality in the business, and he says, I know what people want, people don't know what they want. I'm going to do what I think people want. Well, it worked for Steve Jobs, right? But it doesn't work for a lot. A lot of businesses think, I know what people want, and they go out there and they offer products and services that people don't want, which is why they go broke really, really quickly. Okay? And then our next one is a nonprofit. And uh, so, like the Wildlife Foundation, the World Wildlife Foundation, they'll throw, they'll raise awareness for the animals that people will consider cute and then they'll let other ex like other animals that are probably more in need of funds and stuff basically go extinct because they're not going to get consumer appeal they're not going to they're not the cute animal that people want to see on TV that they're like ooh I saved a sloth or something like that there, people are not concerned about the horny toad or yeah. the pit viper that that you know is going to be you know a threat to them so if if you're saving things like Elephants, right? You're going to do really, really well, but saving the, you know, warthog <laughs> is probably not going to be a real big winner, okay? But uh, on that same line or whatever, uh, nonprofits throw resources at problems and they try to just keep continually throw resources at them and sometimes it um, affects their future sustainability, they can't support themselves because they're continually relying on more donations, more donations, but if donations don't come, then they fail. Um, and then our last one is governmental, and we kind of broke this down into do two different parts. So like a main one is like the Freedom Riders, there's a group of rational individuals trying to go for a rational um, goal, and then the government strikes them down and says, no, we have to stick to the status quo. We've got Bull Connor that's not letting them even pass through their city. But then you can take that to being like with Trump or whatever, who's trying to keep foreigners out. But some of our greatest advancements in America have come from foreigners, like Einstein, who's German. You've got Marie Curie, who's Polish, who went to France, doesn't ever live in America. And you've got like Alexander Fleming, who's Scottish, who like makes penicillin. And like without foreigners, like we have so many things that America, like that makes America kind of great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the one of the things that you're you're that's that's absolutely true. He says, for example, the president has said we're going to grow the American economy so that it's going to grow at a rate of six percent. We can't grow at a rate of six percent. Well, we could, if you wanted to let way the economy grows is it becomes more productive. The only way you're going to become more productive generation over generation is if you keep having larger generations that are contributing to the workforce. The American generation or the American population for the most part with the exception of immigration is getting older and retired. That means they're not being productive. They're not, they're not giving themselves, they're not producing things that people want. When you get retired, what do you do? You sit around and you play pinochle. That doesn't make anybody better off except maybe in your own mind. Where does productivity and GDP increase come from? It comes from the guy who's bolting the tire on the Buick that's going to be sold, that's going to contribute to the economy, not by somebody sitting around in retirement. So if you want to grow the economy, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to have, at this, at this stage of our development, you're going to have to have a pretty healthy immigration policy. Otherwise, your population gets older, they become less productive, and your gross domestic product is going to shrink. That's just inevitable. So yeah, that's that's a good example. I think that's a really really good example. Okay, so let's see. We're 
on the second row. Who's got the, which, where does your group go to? It stops there. So I've got a group over here. Okay. All right. Um, I guess I'm speaking, which is really terrifying for everyone in this room right now. Um, <laughs> we decided you to... You can let somebody else spokesperson. Uh, I tried. I <laughs> you begged. tried? I begged. I got your back. You, you, you attempted to push um, it off on somebody else? And very, very hardly tried. Um, that's not even a word. But anyways, um, we decided to go and really try for those five bonus points or 30 or how many you're giving. Oh, 30, you're pushing. <laughs> That's We're wanting them all. Um, yeah, 50. Yeah. 50, I see. Yeah, okay, so we decided uh, to say organizations are not more rational than individual consumers um, simply because organizations, um, there's a lot of people that go into making those, decis those decisions, and the larger number of people, the lower the quality of the decision. I think that's absolutely a good, one of the things that you would think is that there would be more rationality in large organization decision making, but what you can suffer from if you get too many people right. making the decision is that it becomes impossible to actually make rational decisions right. because everybody's going to fight for their own right. position. Right, we, we say that as well, um, the majority of organizations, though they don't have simple structures, meaning that um, multiple heads and decision makers, like there's multiple people throughout the company, and each manager or each person making that decision has their own biases, they all have their own um, limitations, and that would go into making their decisions, so they're just going to come, yeah, to like all these goal conflicts, and uh, which will then hinder the decision making process. And you also get to the point of like groupthink, where there's uh, people will just do whatever they think is, or they'll just decide for what one person says because they don't want to think for themselves. Um, and it becomes less efficient because it takes longer to make a decision when there's more people. Um, agreeing with the sake of, yeah. That's correct. I yeah. mean, that's one of the things that you, you have in any large organization where you have more than one person making a decision, it's not efficient. It's right. not an efficient decision-making process. And like also with groupthink, you have people thinking, okay, well there's this many people making this decision. If we all agree, then um, nothing can go wrong, which breeds this false optimism and can lead to like obsessive risk-taking. Risk um, we said like for profit, profit companies, especially monopolies, are huge contributors contributors to international thinking um, because like the diamond company um, De Beers yes mm -hmm. like a huge percentage of the market share they have no economic pressure to set rational price in, in comparison to what diamonds are actually worth that's right diamonds should be a semi-precious right. stone they're actually fairly common they're not because De Beers restricts the, the control of the market it's the only in the history of Cartels, it's the only cartel that's been really, really successful. Like the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, which a lot of people think is very successful at controlling oil prices, has been radically unsuccessful at controlling oil prices over a long term. In short term, they can influence oil prices, but they've never been able to do it long term. De Beers has managed to control the price of diamonds for a hundred years. Um, so that was like our for profit example. And the non profit, um and like while their purpose is to benefit communities surrounding them, like it's ethically positive, but it's not necessarily like a consistent form of produc production and servicing. Um, like the Salvation Army, for example, relies on receiving donations and turns selling items back to the community as a discounted price. And without those donations from the community, the business would fail. So it's like um, rationally. It's very depending on right. other people for them themselves. Okay. And then with the government decision making, we kind of tied it back to uh, with government decision making, it's more broad due to making decisions for such a large number of people, um, which then leads to back to the um, group think or um, what was the other word? Right. Right. Or uh, satisficing, for example, like uh, you just do with what's good and not what's best. Right. And that's that's a really important point. Yeah, you just go with what is the path of what will what will suffice rather than what is the best alternative possible. I think that's a that's an important point. Okay, very good. Who's speaking for you all? So our group, we came up, or we believe that organizations are also less rational than individual consumers. Um, 
years. And kind of building off what we said, um, we said that like entities have um, representatives with radically different views. And our example of this was like the government's decision to support or fund Planned Parenthood. Um, they can't decide whether or not to fund it or not to fund it because they can't decide on what the best outcome is. Right. So if they don't agree, then they're not going to make the best decision. You've got 50% of the population that wants you to support Planned Parenthood and 50% of the population that's adamantly opposed to supporting Planned Parenthood. Right. And so rather than looking at the best decision, uh, I think that's an interesting example, yes. That and then our next reason is that organizations may not be as concerned with how they spend their money because it's not their own personal money. So an example of this that we used was Susan G. Komen. So much of her money, or so much of that money from that nonprofit mm -hmm. goes towards marketing rather than actually cancer research. Right, the vast majority of it goes to television ads. Right. And right. ad buys to and, get more money. And then our third reason was that um, for-profit organizations may not even know what their own needs are to spend their money wisely. So there's like a whole TV series called like Undercover Boss, uh -huh. where the CEO goes undercover within the company to learn where the problems are, and it shows time and time again how completely oblivious they are to like what's going on on like the base level of the company. How completely disconnected they are from what's actually going on in terms of delivering pizzas and things like that. I do like that show. It's one of the ones that I think is really fascinating to watch and to see how these people have gone from, at one point in time, they may have known, they may have even started out working at the company at a very low level, or they may have been the founder. And they find out that it's become a radically different organization than what it was when they, when they started. So I think that's a really good, good example. All right, very good. Good examples, let's see. So the back row. All right, we want the, 50 bonus points or 100 bonus points or whatever. I like how you all assume that there's like this infinite number of bonus points possible. So we we found three examples to support the to support the fact that organizations tend to act in a less rational manner than individuals. And first off we started out by defining rationality, what it means to be rational, and basically came off of Google as well as some of the ideas of our members that to act, to act within reason and logic behind your actions where the results yield the most benefit. And in a business context, that would more so mean to act in a financially responsible manner where invested parties are benefited. It's kind of what we came up with. And first we wanted to look at the government as acting irrationally. Um, oftentimes political figures, they fear fuel to, or they, they fuel use fear. fear to fuel their political agendas. And it, one of the more prominent examples that we came up with was with gun control policies. And we rarely hear from either side of the, the debate until you know a large tragedy happens. Like Las Vegas. Like Las Vegas. Um, politicians are no stranger to the waving the bloody shirt you know, technique of politics. And you know, because of that, well, and a more specific example would be, you know, Hillary Clinton, not long after, tweeted, uh, tweeted that, you know, they need to take down the NRA and stuff like that, you know, fueling that agenda off of the emotion, whether it be for the best interest of the people or not, that's how they, that's how they fuel their political agendas. And then next we wanted to look at the ALS organization, or association, is what it's called, the ALS Association and the Ice Bucket Challenge. Um, not long ago, this... So ALS is Lou Gehrig's disease. Yes, Lou Gehrig's disease. So For those of you who don't know, Lou Gehrig died of Lou Gehrig's disease. Like, you couldn't see that one coming. <laughs> <laughs> Should have known. Um, but not so long ago, the Ice Bucket Challenge was super popular. A lot of people were doing it. You saw the videos on Facebook and YouTube of people dumping the water on themselves. And there was, at some point... You know, a lot of people didn't necessarily realize that it was for ALS research that they were doing it. Originally, uh, the ALS Association um, posed this challenge where you can donate to the ALS Association to further research of the further research of the disease, or you can dump ice water on yourselves. And the ice bucket challenge, what it was named, ended up you know being more popular for the ice buckets than the ALS. And a more rational way of doing that would have somehow 
in implementing ALS in the challenge, uh, a lot of people kind of took the ice bucket thing and ran with it. And in the end, donations were minimal to the ALS Association. And then lastly, CVS Pharmacy. Uh, within the last fiscal year, they dropped, they lost coverage of Tricare and Blue Cross Blue Shield, lost millions. And then this past week, they came out with a new policy where they will only accept seven day prescriptions for opioids or narcotics. And this, they are the only company that has come out and said this. And they did this because of the opioid crisis in the U.S. kind of, you know, getting you know, hit in the limelight with uh, American media. And uh, they're sure to lose, you know, a ton more customers because of that. Especially since Walgreens, Walmart, they haven't said anything about it. And as far as we know, they're going to continue to do it. So that was acting in an irrational manner because they're going to end up losing a lot more money. And so in conclusion, you know, we found that organizations are not always acting in a more rational manner. Okay. Well, very good. I like your examples. You came up with some really unique examples to uh, to illustrate how it's less rational. I think that's, I think you came up with ones that are really interesting and insightful. I'm sure you all will have won bonus points. Let's yeah. see. Who's going to speak for this group over here? Okay. You look so thrilled. Oh, yeah. Um, so we thought companies were irrational as well. One example for a for profit would be Tesla, because at the time when Elon Musk decided to come out with oh. this, cars, you know, it's a oil dominated field, so you wouldn't think that would be successful, but now it's actually taken off quite a bit. It's kind of growing, I'd say, so I think that was a good decision to kind of, it was definitely a risk, because, you know, people are always afraid about, you know, where am I going to charge it, and like all the factors about it, but I think Right, I mean, that, that was a, that was a huge risk. Yeah. And there's something called the business judgment rule, the BRJ. So you can file derivative lawsuits if you're a shareholder against your company. And if you can prove to the court that the, share, uh, that, the, that the executives basically wasted corporate resources, you may be able to get those resources back or disgorged um, from them or, or something else happens to be. But it's tempered by something called the business judgment rule, which basically says business is inherently risky. And that was a huge risk. But in hindsight, it's paid off, so was it irrational? I think at the time it was irrational, but now if you think back on it, it's rational because you know it's a new market that's taken off alternative energy. So yeah, I can see a rational side of it because green is popular now. People want to do their part to reduce emissions. But I think at the time, since it was such a monopoly on vehicles, and there's been a bunch of cars in the past that failed too, it was definitely a risk at the time. Okay. Um, and then, so for uh, government, I, I think that the moon race was kind of irrational because, you know, at the time it was just more like, oh yeah, we're better than the commies, so we're going to beat them to the moon, beat them to the moon kind of thing. It wasn't we didn't like, beat them to space, so we're going to beat them at something. So, I mean, the moon didn't have a whole huge thing of oil on it, so it was basically, you know, it's a rock. We just got the flag on it, and yeah, you know, but like, I don't think it was... Our most rational thing in our country to do at the time. It was a completely. It was very decision. expensive, yeah. most expensive program at the time in history. So, yeah, I mean, it was kind of more of a morale kind of thing. Like, yeah, we're better, but yeah. And then, for we kind of said the same kind of deal with charities that you would expect charities to have the funds go to the people it's for, but they do have to advertise and they have to do certain things to draw people in. So. And they have to pay their employees, so it's just the way, it's a business in a sense, so it has to, you know, in an ideal world, it go to, all the funds would go to the people that need it, but it just So let me ask you this, does that make the charity itself irrational or the people who contribute to the charity irrational? I think it's just a, it's a, uh, <laughs> uh, Are you an idiot for contributing to the Red Cross or the A's? You know, I, I don't mean, think I, I really... I suffer from dissociative personality disorder, so I don't like most people, but I do like animals. It sounds like right, it. and I, I love and so you know like the ASPCA comes on and I'm crying and they got yeah and I'm like writing the check. So am I irrational or is the charity irrational? I think you. Well, I don't think you're irrational because it's it's hard. It's it's not convenient for you to go seek out and give money to you. 
best source of helping that specific animal. You know, that's why organizations organizations are convenient, so people can, you know, ideally like think in their heart, oh yeah, this is gonna go straight to that dog I saw on TV. Right. But it's it's gonna, Fluffy's gonna be safe. Yeah. I mean, it's not it's not gonna work out that way, but I think it's just a necessary evil in a sense because although you want it to go to that dog, there has to be certain things to be accounted for. Okay. All right. All right. Very good. Do we have another group? Is there anybody else? I think Bert's went to the last one. Did we get to everybody? Did you, your group? Okay. Um, we said that. Hold on one second. Got to. Let me see. There's a big line across my thing. All right, go ahead. Um, we said that organizations and individuals are pretty much all irrational. However, um, organizations are slightly more rational. Um, and we said that uh, for-profit companies are irrational because they're mostly considered with profit responsibility instead of like societal. Basically, they're trying to, uh, we did kind of, if a company was rational based off of the, if they maximize the benefit for their company or, or people based off the financial spending they use. Um, so we said that uh, for-profit companies like for example, Toshiba, they uh, had an accounting, accounting scandal recently that uh, overstated their operating profit quite a bit, and uh, you know, it was a real corrupt uh, company that isn't looking out for the consumer or really even the product they're making a lot of times. They're just looking for uh, how much money they can get in return, and they pay their uh, executives quite a bit of money. Uh, that tends to be wasted, and, uh, the companies can do bad investments, research new markets, stuff like that, that isn't always rational thinking. Okay, now that is an important point. One of the things that they've done is they've done several studies on correlations between executive pay and the success of a company as determined by its P-E ratio. What's the P-E ratio? Anybody know? Five. Uh, how many of you have had Counting. Is it the published over earnings? It's price uh, price earnings price ratio, price right? Price or, and and they've done this analysis on it, and they found out that the highest paid executives are usually at the poorest performing firms. If you make that much money, why well, not really try that? Right. That would that would seem to be counter to the thought. The idea is we're going to pay all this money, and we're going to get the best, and they're going to take our company to a much higher level. Right, with Carly Fiorina at, at Hewlett Packard. She ran for president saying, I was the chief executive, I know how to run a company. Yeah, you ran it into the ground, <laughs> lady. Like, you were horrible at it. Why should you, you want to do for America what you did for Hewlett Packard? <laughs> really? No. Okay, go ahead. Um, then we did nonprofit is one of the more rational ones um, because they. Uh, are more focused on societal responsibility. They spend their money to benefit people and don't really spend a lot of money on lavish extra things within their own company. They don't pay their executives a ton of money. And they try to get the most, uh, the maximum amount of money that they take in, they try to get it back out to help people and uh, you know, spend it on their product instead of on extraneous details and things. Okay. Um, we said the government is irrational because a lot of times their bureaucracy and the laws they have dictate how they can spend their money. Um, for example, recently, Puerto Rico, it took the government a while to get in there. Um, specifically, oh, and the, that was another one, in nonprofit, they uh, got into Puerto Rico very quickly because they didn't have the bureaucracy and they didn't have to um, wait for all that to happen, for all the workings of that to happen. And specifically with the government, there's the Jones Act, which makes it where to send things to Puerto Rico, it has to be done from American companies, American dock workers on American ships. Right. And we didn't have enough to send everything there, so it took a little bit for the Jones Act to be waived so we could use foreign vessels to get products in there. Right. Whereas the nonprofits didn't have to waste time on that. Um, and also the government, like I said, they spend money sometimes on things that only help a small amount of people instead of a great amount of people. Um, that's true. They, they have a tendency to help the people who have the... the yeah, or the, the ones that are the loudest. Not yeah. a, you know, I mean, uh, why, why did the NAACP become so powerful? They were really loud for a long time. Um, 
and then our last point on that is how the government doesn't really, they're, they're responsible for the general public and they don't necessarily maximize their productivity or their work. We could spend more money on health care and schools to maximize, uh, health care to maximize the amount of time that, say, an elderly person could work or our, that wouldn't be a drain on society or the amount of education a student would get so they have better uh, competitive skills in the job market. Um, and then on the individual, we said they're irrational based off, basically they, they get necessities they need, which is a rational thought process, but typically they spend just an overtly lavish amount of money on things. It's like get a humongous house when you really could do with the smaller one, or get a car when it's a crazy amount of money when you get a lesser one. And then also a point you made last class where people just continue to buy stuff. They just buy crap until they fill in their house, then they keep buying crap until it goes, you know, in the storage shed, and just keeps, and people just and they become hoarders. To buy stuff, yeah, right, yes. Yeah. It's, um, it's just this vicious cycle. Of people just continue to see things. It's like a little child in candy store. People really see a pretty shiny thing, they want it, and then they bring it back, and then they do that until they run out of room. Right. Okay. Did we get everybody? Yeah. yeah yes, All right. So make sure somebody uploads your your answer to the Dropbox by today. And we will finish talking about this and move into global on Thursday. I passed the roll sheet. If you didn't sign the roll sheet, if you didn't write, you sure get it. Where is it? At? Where's the roll sheet? Right here.